Second Corinthians chapter nine. As Chris says, sometimes let, uh, if you've got your device, that would be your Bible. At this point. All right. Uh, verse one says, "Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness." about which I boast of you to the Macedonians that Achaia was ready a year ago and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Yet I have sent the brethren lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect that as I said you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we not to mention you should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. But this I say, he who so sparingly will also read sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also read bountifully. So let each one give as he, possibly, as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has even to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Uh, even someone who taking, is taking notes, uh, my title today is, Why Should I Give Hilariously? Or Why Should I Give Gladly? Uh, we'll take the verse 6, which says that, uh, sorry, verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes, in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, the word cheerful in Greek just it, it means hilarious. Uh, so, people, how many of us speak Greek here? Is it true, Matt? Hilarious? <laughs> which, uh, which we get the root word, the English word, hilarious. And we know that it is true that uh, we make a living by what we get. Is it true? What you get, I mean, if you earn lot and lot means also your expenses will as well go up. But it, it is equally true that we make a life by what we give. But I will talk on the, the second uh, part of it, by making a life of what we give. Uh, why should we give hilariously as we read from these verses you know in our flesh our human flesh we always feel like giving is something very painful <coughs> to sacrifice if I've been told to part with my coach to give it to someone of my size I don't know who is my size here like, God really do you want me to give that guy this coat and I really treasure it for the ladies, for the girls, I think your shoes, you really treasure them. They are specific shoes that you really treasure. And you're like, should I really part with it? No, I can't. I will wear them until, I mean, I can't do anymore. So as in, that's how we've been raised. And it's a natural uh, human being feelings. It's a fleshly, I would say, feeling in, within us that giving should be painful, it should be heavy. And sometimes we've had some preachers, if it's not costing you, if it's not painful, then it's not giving. But I think that's not true. According to the Bible, God loves a cheerful giver. And as we are giving, it's not like we are boasting or we are showing up. No. It is something that we love because God already showed himself that he's a cheerful giver, he's an, and he's an hilarious God by giving us Jesus. For God so loved he didn't say, for God felt a lot of pain, as you know, just to give Jesus. But because he loved us, you know, 
Give his only begotten son. And so giving should be a party for us. You know? We've been to a party, I believe so. That's how it should be expressed. It should be hilarious. It should be something that is so much joyful as you're looking forward to it. Then why should we give hilariously when I mean all our flesh is actually speaking the opposite? Like it's pain, it's a sacrifice. Well, there are some reasons here that I mean we'll just go and learn them bit by bit. Number one, why should we give hilariously? Because God's promise something to us. He has promised something to us. That's why we, we give it to him. Second Corinthians says, the one we read, uh, verse, verses uh, 6 says, Now he who sows sparingly will do what? Reap sparingly. And he who sows generously will reap generously. And in Amplified say, And he will be blessed. He will be blessed. Luke chapter 5 and uh, no need to open there, but I'll just paraphrase it. Jesus is in the Sea of Galilee, and he wants to preach. And then he comes to Peter. And we know the character of Peter before he was converted. And he says, hand me over your boat. I want to use it to preach. And of course, Peter keeps him the boat. And he preaches on it. But later on, we see what happens. When they are tall through the night, and are not catch any fish, and then Jesus tells him, launch into the deep. And what happens? They were able to catch a massive haul of fish. That just shows that God is God. You cannot outgive God. He's not a debtor of man. As he promised, then he will do it. And we see that, I mean, not only was uh, Peter able to catch fish for food to enhance his business, but later on, he was converted and was now a fisher of men. I mean, God does, I mean, multiplication when we do give. We can't really outgive him. In fact, uh, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord with your possession and the first fruit of your increase. Then your bonds will and your past will be overflowing. And we can really see that it's happening in Peter's life. Uh, you know, God has just given us an opportunity to test it. There is no any other place that God has given us uh, to test it. How many people love being tested? Oh! There is one here. <laughs> and that's amazing. Uh, you, you know, personally, I don't love, I mean, uh, tests. When I used to be in school, like, wow. What about you? Do you love tests? <laughs> <laughs> like exams? No. But, I mean, God, I mean, but God has given us the opportunity to examine him. Exactly. There is no any other place in the scripture that we ought to test God, except in our tithes and offering. Amen? Amen. I, mean, I mean, that's the only opportunity that God has had. We want to examine you in this, I mean, as we do it. But we're not doing it as in, uh, just to showcase what we can, but applying the principle of his word. In Malachi chapter 3, verses uh, 8 on 1, it says, uh, Will a man rob God, yet you have robbed me? But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings you have withheld. You are cast with the cast, for you are robbing me, this whole nation. Bring all the tithes, the, uh, the tenth into the store, so that may be found in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out for you so great a blessing until there is no room, no enough room for you to be seated. So, I mean, God has given us an open door to come. Yet most of us, we, we say like, we don't want to go through that door. Yet God has given an opportunity to really test him in that by our giving. And he says this, I will be able to open windows of heaven for you that I may bless you with blessings that I mean there won't be any room in now. I mean, to really contain all these blessings. So 
So one of the promises we see being fulfilled, the Lord says that I will rebuke the devourer on your behalf. I mean, that's powerful to us. I don't have to take that opportunity to work spiritual warfare. As I apply the principle of God by testing him, then on his side, what does he do? He rebuke the devourer on my behalf. The Lord says that I will protect you from this one who causes your appliances to break down. Any one of us that has experienced that, your appliances breaking down? <laughs> uh, your car stalling? Wow. Your finances crumbling? You may ask, is Solomon suggesting that the devil is behind everything? I mean, our appliances, you know, falling apart in our car stalling? No, I didn't say that. But what is God is saying is that the enemy has all kinds of plans to keep us in debt. To keep us perpetually in the home. That's what is there to steal. You know, steal our joy, steal our peace. When your car is falling and it's raining heavily and you're in, in the middle of nowhere, you have no joy. Exactly. If you've experienced that, I have, I have, had, I have had an experience such a way it was hard. Thank God it was a manual car, so I was able to, you know, just push it to the next station. But the Lord is saying, I want to defend you. I want to see you through miraculously. Trust me to rebuke the devourer, the one who eats at you personally and financially. Amen. That's our God. He opens a way for us to test him, but yet again, there is a blessing in it as we test him as well. Malachi 3.12 says, All nations shall call you happy and blessed, for you shall be a land of delight, says the Lord. You may ask yourself, does this mean we tithe, when we tithe and give offering, we'll be rich? Does it mean that? Does it mean that? No. How many people have tithe and given offering, but you can't quantify that in terms of materials and, and money. But the Bible says, we will be blessed. And most of us, I think, in our generation, they have quantified blessing to be material thing, to be money thing, you know, uh, my wealth. But in the Lord's eye, it goes beyond that. In fact, the Bible says, seek me first, you know, my right is in my kingdom and all this. So the other things are just an additional thing. But a person who is blessed is a person who has, I mean, is a person who uh, doesn't, I mean, there is no tension in their life. There is a freedom, there is a contentment. A blessed person is a person who is content, is a person who is experiencing liberty of God, and there is absence of tension in their life. That is a person that we call blessed. And as we respond to God's ways, those are the experiences that we do get. So why should I give hilarity? Why should you give hilarity? Because of God's promise that he will reward, he will rebuke, and he will revive. If you forget anything, God's promise to us is that he will rebuke, he will reward, and he will revive. Amen. Amen. Number two. The reason why we should give hilariously is because of God's purpose for us. Matthew 6.21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be be also. What's God's purpose for you? What God's purpose for me? His purpose is for us to live in heaven eternally. Amen. But you know we so easily get stuck in the world system because of the things that surround us and negativity that comes on our way. But God says, I have a way to get your heart in heaven. Put your treasure there. I've written here, inevitably, people who invest in heaven become increasingly interested in the coming of Christ and the coming of the kingdom. If your treasure is in a retirement fund, your heart will be there. You'll be looking for what I want to retire. You know, I'm just aiming that uh, two years to go, one more year to go. And your heart is there. If your treasure is in some material object, I was saying maybe shoes for the ladies. <laughs> Uh, maybe ties or shirts for men. 
and all those jackets for men. You will be always like, ah, what's new in the market? The fashion and your treasure is there, you know. If your treasure is in a, a sports car, I love sports car. <laughs> <laughs> you may love it, but I mean, if your treasure is there, that's what you'll be looking for. Like, you know, my, I have to get rid of my old one to get a new one. If it's in a vacation, then you'll be always looking like every month, uh, where should I go next? So your treasure also will be there. But if your treasure is uh, regularly invested in heaven, you will find yourself increasingly kingdom oriented. Amen. And that's why I thank God that God has given us opportunity for the cafe shop to venture in it. We are kingdom oriented. Amen. We are not only self-centered. We want to reach other people. Let them experience the God that we are experiencing in our lives. Hallelujah. Number three. God's premise about us. Another reason that we should give hilariously, joyously is God's premise about us. Luke 6, 13, 6 to 13 says, Be merciful, sorry, be merciful, responsive, compassionate, tender, just as your heavenly Father is merciful. Do not judge others self-righteously, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others when you are guilty and unrepentant, and you will not be condemned for your hypocrisy. Pardon others when they truly repent and change, and you will be pardoned when you truly repent and change. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your love a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over with no space left for more. For with the standard of measurement you use, when you do good to others, it will be measured to you in return. You know, over and over in scripture, God has been calling his people stiff naked, you know, heart of heart. But he's not saying it hatefully or condemning, no. Do you know that God knows that we are very stiff naked? I am a stiff naked person. I don't know about you, I'm hard hearted. God knows that. I mean, I can't, I, can't, I can't deceive myself in that. You can't deceive yourself. And that's why God said, the Bible says that we all fall short of the glory of God. In one, I mean, we, we sin, but the grace of God is there. When we come back to Him, we experience His grace that helps us to draw back to Him. So God is saying that, I want you to be different. I want you to be bigger person. I want you to be forgiving, to be merciful, and compassionate. I want you to relate to people. Most of us, we find that's very hard, relating with people. Like, I can't get along with that guy. My neighbor in, the, in that corner is a nuisance, you know. Uh, my colleague, I have no words. I just want to move to the next job, you know. You're running away. You can't really get along. You know, but God wants you to care about people. <coughs> He wants you to love people like he does. And that's why he's giving us opportunity. You know, when you give, you're not only giving of your substance, but also you give yourself as well. Because I mean, as you, it's, it's a form of surrender. Meaning I can part with it happily because I know the one that has given all of himself to me is greater. And has shown me an example that I can go forth and do. And so you may ask yourself, is there a direct correlation between caring about people and material resources? You may ask us, is there a direct relation? Is there? How many think it's, there is a direct relation between caring people and giving away resources? Oh, we only have a few. Okay, let, we will learn today. Actually, there is. We've seen uh, the book of Luke chapter 6, 35 to 38. I want you to go and read it. Jesus said, we are to measure them by how generous we are financially. In other words, we will know how we are doing with people by how we handle our money. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's a self-evaluation. How I handle my money will really portray how I value people, how I value others. If I'm 
truly forgiving, merciful, and compassionate, it will show. If we claim to love people but are not giving, let, let me say financially, we are fooling ourselves. For Jesus inextricably tie the two together. And that's why that verse is there. You know, be compassionate, be loving to other people. And then it says, give. So they are correlated all together. So giving is not God's way of raising cash, if you thought that. It doesn't need your money. But giving is God's way of raising kids. Amen. God is raising up. He knows that we are very greedy. I mean, if you do a self-evaluation, you realize that, like, before you part with your money, like, even to bless someone, it takes a while for really the Holy Spirit to stir you up, you know, motivate you, and be like, yes, 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 you know, it takes time. God knows that, but he wants us to, to come from that place of being self-centered, amen, to have his perfect image. That's why he didn't withhold his son. He said, like, these guys are stiff naked. I don't want to send my son. But he said, how will do that? And that's what God also wants us to emulate. To see what he has done. And as we are presenting Jesus Christ here in this side of eternity, we being the ambassadors, we also do likewise from what we've learned from our Father in heaven. Amen. So, God wants to free us from these tendencies. So every time an offering basket comes by and it will come during worship, I'm not like, uh, you know, thinking about it. I'm looking forward to give joyously because he has given all to me and he's just asking a bit from me. So as I'm giving, uh, as I'm giving unto the Lord, I'm just saying like, God, I want to be more like you. I want to be more like you. I'm, I'm not only giving of the substance I have, but I'm also giving myself as well to you. Number four, God's process in and through us. God's process in and through us. First Timothy 6, 17 to 19 says, As for the rich in this present world, instruct them not to be conceited and arrogant, nor to set their hope on their sanctity of riches, but on God who richly and ceaselessly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, willing to share with others. In this way, storing up for themselves the enduring riches of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take all of that which is truly life. As we've just seen, God is a giver, and all he wants from us is to be like him. So God is not in heaven saying that it is hard being God. No. If you thought God is saying, man, it's hard being God. These guys, I don't want to just be God. But I mean, God is in heaven and is he, I mean, there is hilarity in heaven. There is unspeakable joy in heaven. There is everlasting peace in heaven. There is pure and holy love. Praise and resounding. As you're saying, I'm broken, praise be yours. That is what is in heaven. So God knows that giving is hard, but still he demands it. It's not something that we, we negotiate with him, but he demands it. Not because God is mean. You say, like, God, you're mean. No, it's not mean. But he wants to help us to be like him. Amen. So it's a demand. But the demand comes with a blessing as well. It's not like the way we do it when we demand people some things, you know, because they owe us. No. It's a demand. But as well, it comes with a blessing because he's helping us. He's raising us up. Amen. He's perfecting us. He's sharpening our character into his image and his likeness. A good example is Abraham. Uh, Genesis chapter 14. He has just come from successfully rescuing his nephew Lot. You know. And then uh, he, he meets King of Salem. Who was the King of Salem? If you can remember. Melchizedek. <laughs> he meets this King of Salem 
And then King of Salem uh, blesses him with bread and wine. And then because Abraham sends God, he gives his time of all that he had won in that war or taken back. And then after some time, Abraham comes and meets King of Sodom. And we know what Sodom really was, what was in Sodom, exactly. A lot of stuff were happening there. And then this king tells him, like, give me the people that you rescue, you know, and, and then keep the goods for yourself. But no, Abraham said, like, I want even a shoeless. I won't give it. But, this is what I learned from that story. If Abraham had not sensed God and obeyed from the beginning when he met the king of Salem, he would have succumbed to the temptation of the kingdom of Sodom. Well, you may ask yourself, what, what, what has it to do with now? But the kingdom of Sodom comes to us by telling us, grab this, buy this, get this. You know, but they're not really helpful to us. They may come in terms of newspaper. You just buy newspaper. I mean, you just go for buy newspapers. You, you, you buy some electronics that you don't need just to prove that, I mean, you've got much. But it's not helpful. The kingdom of Sodom, I mean, always speak to us. Like, I'm craving for those chocolates. Man, I'm just going to that shop and uh, buy a bunch of them. Ten pounds gone. Then in a month you realize I've spent over a hundred pounds on chocolate, which is not a name. Is that <laughs> Yeah, so that's the kingdom of Sodom. He always ministers, but when we, we sense God and we obey his principle, then we shut our ears from the kingdom of Sodom. I don't what I don't know what you really crave for every single week. But I mean, you can tell the kingdom of Sodom actually, no, no more voices from you. Let me use what God has blessed me to enhance his kingdom. Amen. And that's what God wants us to do. And then finally, why should we give hilariously? Because of God's presence with us. Amen. God's presence with us. Second Corinthians 8, 9. For you are recognizing more clearly the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his astonishing kindness, his generosity, his gracious favor, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich, abundantly blessed. So the final reason that we should be giving hilariously and joyously is because God gave us Jesus as I began. So if there is only one reason that you and I should give, that will be more than enough because God gave Jesus. Amen. It's not only because, you know, some people, they think, as I, as I give, then I will receive blessing, of which is a principle. So you're really looking forward for the blessing. But the key reason that we should give hilariously is because he gave us Jesus. Look at the wise men. What did they bring? Before baby Jesus, youth, what did they bring? The three kids, Francis, Mary, and God. Did they receive any gift from Jesus? Did they receive any gift? Anyone, did these guys receive any gift from Jesus? And that's how we should take it literally. There's a point I've written here. These wise men, when they came to Jesus, they did not give Jesus an expected miracle. No, there was no miracle that happened. They didn't expect insight. Sometimes we give that we may get insight. Something that we are not getting clarity. So it's like we give with a condition, actually, I would say. It's like we give, but there is a condition attached to it. This guy, they gave, but there was no condition attached to it. And also, 
They didn't expect for Jesus to pronounce a blessing. Who didn't pronounce a blessing at two-year baby? Anyone who has come across a two-year baby who can't pronounce a blessing? Yeah. Yeah. God bless you. You know, you'll be richly blessed and you're going out. And you're coming in. No. This guy gave because they knew Jesus is the king of kings. Amen. And as we are giving, we are giving to the king of kings and lord of lords. As I say, when I bless Malcolm, I'm not blessing him simply because there's a string attached to Malcolm being my friend. But I'm, as I'm blessing him, the Bible says, as you give to the list of my brethren, you give it unto me. Amen. So as I'm blessing you as an individual with the possession that God has blessed me, it's not only Matt, but I'm honoring God as well. You know, and I'm appreciating that he has shown me an example and I can also show an example to the rest that God brings on my way. Amen. So why am I saying all this? That I mean, our giving to the Lord should not be painful. So sometimes it may be sacrificial, but it should come out of a cheerful, hilarious, joyous heart. Amen. And that's what God loves. Because, I mean, when God sees you cheerful, it's like you're emulating me. I mean, you're, you're really taking my image, you're taking my likeness. And the one will see that, and they glorify our Father in heaven. 